glad to see everybody out this morning. Um, we have been down in our tents last few weeks for various different reasons, vacations, graduations, weddings, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I'm glad you're here this morning, and I, I hope this morning's message will seek into your hearts, Lord, and that we would apply these things to our life. Before I begin, I want to wish Brady and Pat a happy anniversary. I uh, hope you enjoy your, your day together. It's always a special time when we remember the day that we were married upon. Growing up as a kid, um, and in fact, I don't know if this is who you are, but a lot of kids, I always want to be part of a group. I remember some of the groups that I was a part of growing up. I was part of the Cub Scouts for quite a while, and it got to a certain point where I was playing sports, and I couldn't show up my scouts meetings anymore, so I ended up playing sports instead of going to scouts. But being on teams, uh, you have goals and things that you set, you play as a team. The coaches try to bring everyone together and play their part and do their part. And being a part of a crowd or a group or something like that is something that's a part of each and every one of us. So the question this morning is, are you a part of the crowd? And if you are a part of the crowd, which crowd are you a part of? When I was in the fourth grade, I'll never forget this, I had some trouble with my teacher. I'll never forget his name. His name was Mr. Ayala. And Mr. Ayala really gave me a lot of grief when I was a kid. And I can remember going home one day, my mom asked me what was going on. She could tell I wasn't happy. And I said, you know, Mr. Ayala kind of picks on me. I don't really like Mr. Ayala all that much. I can tell you right now, it was a huge mistake on my part to say anything. So my mom went down to school, and she had a little powwow with the principal. And kind of told her that, hey, Mr. Ayala is not being too good to my son, and maybe you should talk to him about it. So when I get back, I think it was on a Friday, she got on a Monday, and from that point on, Mr. Ayala always chose me for everything. And I hated it. All the kids were looking at me, how come he gets to do it again? And they were just like, it was some of the most ridiculous things. Like, I can remember going out to up to recess and there was this big old box of balls and everyone wanted the, you know, the red bouncy ball thing, you know, play up, throw things around, things like that. And we always have to, have to take turns to get the first ball. And for like three weeks straight, hey, Bob, this should go ahead. And everyone's grumbling. How come they just beating? I was, I hated it. I really, really did. And then after this whole year went by, my mom decided to send me to a different school, a private school, a Christian school. I remember going there not knowing anyone. And I said this, you have to make friends fast, otherwise I wouldn't be the outcast. And the thing about it is, when you go to a, a school like I was going to, all these kids have been going there since they were like in kindergarten. They all knew each other, they went to church to each other, they were always together all the time, and here comes this little short kid. Back then I was skinny, okay? A little one of a kid. And I wanted, wanted to fit in. And I could tell right away who the popular group was, the popular crowd. And so I kind of started hanging around with these kids. I don't forget, when I had to ride a bus to school, and there was this kid, his name was John DeVries. And John DeVries, every morning, made me feel welcome. Hey, how you doing? He'd always talk to me, and no one else really would. In fact, I remember giving him the first time in the bus, he said, you want to come sit next to me? He was a good guy. He wasn't one of the popular kids. And I wanted to fit into the popular crowd. So I started hanging around with these kids. I can tell you right now, they didn't last very long. Um, for some reason, and I could list you a bunch of stuff why they did this, but they turned on me. And we got into a fight, a fist fight. And it was one punch from them, that was it. One of those five, you kind of stand there and kind of run, you know, kind of go in circles, you know, and no one's really hitting each other, and all the kids gather around, they're all yelling at each other, ah! you know. I remember he hit me, and that was it. I kind of stood there, okay. And the whole thing about it was, was that this kid, I'll never forget his name. His name was Mike Strutzma. He was the tallest kid in the class, good-looking guy. Everyone liked him, and there's this little runt named Bob Bishop, the new kid. And of course, they're all, my, get them. They're all wanting me to be happy. So from that point on, I kind of figured out at a very young age that sometimes the popular crowd, the popular kids, 
just couldn't be trusted. And I can tell you right now, from that point on, I hung around with all the nerds of the, of the school, all these smart kids, because they were going to turn on me, okay? And I could be my smart aleck self and make them laugh, and some of them were athletes like me, but we all kind of were our own group there. And it was rare that I hang around with the popular kids anymore. I didn't like that crowd. I felt that that crowd was fake. When I look at you this morning and you think about yourself, to look around at each other this morning. And as I start talking using scriptures here, I posted this on Facebook a couple months ago. Had you been in the crowd on the day that Jesus was crucified, when the people were yelling out, crucify him, crucify him, would you have joined in? Would you have been a face in the crowd and had that crowd impact you? Crowds can impact you. They can make you do things that you might not ordinarily do. They can make you think things that maybe you don't necessarily agree on, but if the crowd's doing it, I'm going to do it with them. I believe there were people there that day who showed up to see what was going on, what was this fuss all about, who started yelling, crucify him, because everybody else was. And if you were one of the followers of Jesus, the Bible would say that they spoke up or said, no, can't do that. Maybe they just stood there in the crowd looking, thinking, what happened? What's going on? But would have you joined in with the crowd on that day? We found, find this in Mark chapter 15, 8 through 15. I'm going to read through this. Mark 15, 8 through 15. Then the multitude, the crowd, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that, he could so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? Pilate! The Roman ruler says he hasn't done anything. He's trying to talk them out of this. And yet, what does it say? It says, but they cried out all the more, crucify him. And Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And remember, Barabbas was a known criminal. And he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Let's go to the same story again. I'm going to read a little bit more of this. In Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, 20 through 24. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. Now let me read one more part in Matthew chapter 27. 24 through 24. Through 25. Now this one, I just find to be the crowd has become a mob. It has taken control of their thoughts and their feelings. The things they say should amaze us because it's the power of the crowd. Here's what it says. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. I 
dying. I'm going to allow this man to be crucified just as you are asking, but I find no wrong in him. His blood is on your hands. And what did the crowd say? Here's what they said. And all the people, doesn't say some of them, it says all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. We will take responsibility for this action. If you were in that crowd that day, would those be your words? When I put, put this on Facebook a few months ago, there was a few people who said, I wouldn't do that. I would stood up for them. And I think, okay, you're pretty confident, but I know the power of the crowd. I know the power of a screaming mob. I know the power that affects people. And a lot of people might say, you know what, that was then, this is now. I know what the Bible says. I would never do that today. Going on, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we find another group, another crowd, so to speak. And this is the crowd, and Johnny just talked about this a few weeks ago, where Jesse sent little boy David with some cheese and bread to go see how his brothers were doing. And he brings the cheese and bread, he wants to visit with them and tell dad, okay, here's what's going on. Dad wants to know how his sons are doing. <laughs> and David shows up. And what happens is he gets out there, and what is going on is you have the Philistines on one side of these mountains area over here. I'd probably call it a hill rather than a mountain. On the other side, you have the Israelites. And every day, here comes a guy named Goliath down into the valley. And he stands there, and he challenges them. Bring someone down. Bring it on. I will take on anyone you send down here. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't really say this. I'm going to tell you right now. But can't you hear the Israelite army talking to each other? Look at that guy. He's huge. He's a beast. Saul will tell David he has been a warrior, a soldier, since he was a kid. You think you can take him on? Can't you see the crowd going, there's no way. And no one would challenge. In fact, it says they would run. They were so afraid. Rather than saying, we can do this. That crowd, God's army, the Israelite army was saying, we can't do this. No one can take this guy on. It's not even possible. That's God's army. The crowd, the group, saying, no way. This cannot be done. And here comes David. This kid, this little shepherd boy, comes up and he starts talking. What's going on here? And here's where it reads. 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. And Gagas, David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Going down to verse 28. Now Eliab, he's David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the, to, to the men. And Eliab's anger arose against David and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not cause? So here his older brother says, like, how dare you? You've shown up here to watch the battle. You don't have to fight in it. You, where's your job? You're a shepherd boy. Get back to the sheep. What are you doing out here? Stop insulting us. You don't know what's going on. It says he was angry 
with him. And here's Eliab, David's oldest brother, one of the crowd. One of the crowd. And David stands up for God. And not only does David stand up for God, he did it all by himself. There was no one there to encourage him. In fact, when he goes to see Saul, Saul tried to talk him out of it. Are you crazy? You have no idea what you're doing. Let me try to put Saul's armor on. It was way too big for him. He just wouldn't do it. And he decides, and it's not me. God is the one that will be victorious for me this day. Whenever I read this story, there's so many things that come out of it. It jumps out at me. This time when I'm talking about, I'm talking about God's army, the crowd, the mob that are supposed to be on God's side. They're supposed to be fighting for God, not fighting for Saul, not fighting for themselves. They're fighting for God. And they tell themselves, we can't do this. Can't you hear it? No. That man down there, no, we're going to lose. We can't do this. 1 Samuel 17 explains this to us. Then David said to Saul, this is 32 through 37, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, the servant used to keep his father's sheep. And the lion or bear took the lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord will deliver me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And just hear Saul saying, You're going to need it. You're going to need it. Because this guy is huge. And none of us want to go down there. And all of us believe that you're going to lose. We won't do it because we would lose. The power of the crowd. And yet David was able to stand underneath that and say, I will go. I will go. If you were in that army, would you have been like David? Would you have said, hey David, I'll go with you. I'll go down there with you. I think you're right. I think God's on our side. I'll go with you. I wish you stayed up on top of the hill with everyone else going, you're a nut. There's no way you can win. Yeah, but if you want to go sacrifice, go ahead. Where would you have been? Would you like Eliab thing? What are you doing here? Stop insulting us. Go home. Part of the crowd is very influential. Again, Brother Bob, we have the Bible today. I would never do this. This just wouldn't happen. I would never power before something so evil. Whenever I think of this, what goes through my head is Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Nazi Germany in the 1930s, before the war took place, Hitler's coming into power. He would have these huge rallies. And it would be filled with 100,000 people in a big stadium, if not more than that. And about 90,000 of these people would be for the Nazis. And they'd invite a friend or two. So you're in a stadium of a crowd of people, 100,000 people, and there you are. You've been invited. And you hear this cry, Zieg Heil! Zieg Heil! And Zieg Heil doesn't mean anything but hail victory. But in unison, these people are screaming. And it'd be easy to get carried away with the crowd saying, wow, this guy has some power. Wow. And be impressed with that. 
and allow yourself to join in. And maybe you'll join in, but you're not a true believer. Because there were people there, there were people in Nazi Germany who supported Hitler, who didn't support everything he did. But they came a part of the crowd. And the crowd influenced them. Influenced them either not to speak up or to support the things they did support. And they supported evil. Being a part of the crowd is difficult to resist. This morning as you sit here, this is going on today. I can't explain to you my fear for the future. For the future generations of Christians, of our young people, and how the mob and the crowd of our culture is yelling, crucify him. Because the mob of our culture, the crowd of our culture, is starting to participate and promote things that are obviously contrary to God. I spoke about this last time I was up here. I spoke about abortion. I spoke about homosexuality. And those are easy things. Those are to me obvious things. And yet, our culture is being caught up with this. And for too long, Christians have stood idly by. Well, I don't believe in that. I don't support that. I'm not going to say anything. You might as well be a part of the crowd. If you're not going to stand up and teach what is right and say what is right, even though people around you disagree. they're disagreeing with God, if they're disagreeing with God's standards, isn't it worth standing up and disagreeing? It doesn't mean you have to hate. It doesn't mean you have to scream and yell. It doesn't mean you have to curse people out as they're cursing you out. It doesn't mean any of those things. Stand up for Jesus. Don't be a part of the crowd that is telling you this stuff that you believe in, this stuff that you're buying into is just old, ancient stuff. It no longer applies to me today. Because you know what? That's exactly what the mob said and they said, crucify him. Crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. When the armies of the Lord were up above that hill looking upon that Philistine down there saying, this can't be done. We can't fight back. They were part of the wrong crowd. They were part of a crowd going against God. It happened to an army under a king. It happened to a crowd of people before a Roman ruler. It happened in Germany in the 1930s. And it's happening today in our churches, in our culture, in our nation. Exodus 23, verse 2 says, you should not follow a crowd to do evil. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Now what crowd is that? What crowd are you a part of? Are you a part of the crowd that craves material possessions over spiritual blessings? You see, I'm not going to sit here and talk about homosexuality being wrong, which I believe that it is, or abortion being murdered, which I believe it is, or all the other things that we can point fingers at other people and other groups that we know what they're doing is wrong, and it's easy to stand up to. That is wrong. But what about materialism? When we think about what can I obtain next, I was a part of that crowd. When I was working the private school that I worked at, you should see these cars pull up. Mercedes and all the expensive cars dropping their kids off. I see this every day, and I'm thinking, I wish 
I could have that. That material crowd was working on me, and I believe Satan was working on me. It's easy to fall into that crowd of the material possessions. What about the entertainment crowd? You know we here worship here without the Holy Spirit. Most of us believe that is the way, the only way we should worship God. And we'll point to people, well, look at that church over there. They have musical instruments. All they care about is entertainment. They don't entertain each other during their worship time. They shouldn't be there. And yet, yet, we ourselves will fall in the same trap. Maybe not when it comes to our worship. What about to our lives? I'm going to go see this movie, this movie, and this movie. It's got nudity, cursing and swearing, evilness with inside it. It's just a movie. It's not going to affect my life. The music we listen to. The video games that are played are influencing a lot of people. And it's easy to say, look at them. We need to look at ourselves. Are you part of the entertainment crowd? And now I say that, only really one thing came to my mind. There's a lot of different things that I could say, but it's this. Part of the American culture today is the Super Bowl. On Super Bowl Sunday, it's amazing to see a church and how few people show up for the evening service because the Super Bowl is still going on. I even know about churches whose elders cancel the evening service to make it a guilt-free proposition. I've known churches who had their evening worship at church with a TV right there. And as soon as they were done, turn the TV on. Because that's what they're all thinking about anyway. They want to be entertained by a game. Are you part of the entertainment crowd? I hate doing this, but I'm going to say it because I think it's important. This evening, as I look out there in the crowd, how many of you be here this evening? Or how many of you be at home doing something else? Because it's your time. And on my time, I need to relax. I want to be entertained. Because I work really hard during the week. I don't want to go back to evening worship. I don't want to say that to the guilt trip on me. I only don't. What I want to say is, are you evaluating your life? Where is your commitment to the Lord? Are you part of the crowd in here that half will be back tonight and the other half will find something else to do? And I don't mean be back here. If you want to be back here, you want to go somewhere else to worship, go ahead. But will you give this day to the Lord fully? Or is it just the morning? Is it just here, just for worship time? Well, I came to Bible class too. It's almost like you're punching the clock. In my duty, I'm out. We've got, you know, punch the clock. I was here Wednesday night, I'm out. But during the week, I don't think twice about other things that I could be doing or should be doing with my life, with the things I should be doing for God. I'm too wrapped up in the world that is around me. And it's easy to get caught up in. I don't know if that's you or not. I can tell you this, and I've said it over and over again. I love this congregation. When I walk into the, the kitchen area back there, we meet before worship time. The men are back there. There's a thing that says, the family. I feel that here. I really do. Where I used to work at the school in California, that was the one word everyone brought up. We're family here. And I felt it at that work. I felt it with this congregation. But is the family in tune with each other? And will this family support and love each other? When you're not here on Sunday night, it discourages me. Your presence alone encourages me. Your presence is important, not just for yourself, and not just for the Lord who wants you here, because you want to be here, but it helps me in my walk. It helps others in their walk. 
Will we encourage each other as a church should? 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. This is really the gist of the whole sermon this morning. Yeah, it's about crowds. But here it is. But you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Is this the group that you're a part of? The one that has been set aside. You have been placed special because you obeyed the gospel. I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. I love God the Father. I love my family at church. I love it all. I have been set aside. I'm special. Jesus loved me so much, he died for me. And he died for you. Are you a part of that crowd? And if you are, are you wholeheartedly a part of that crowd, of this group? A group that has been set aside with the purpose of God. Are you a part of that group? I don't know if your toes are being stepped on this morning, but here's the deal. When I prepared this lesson, I'm preaching to me. Sometimes I struggle with these things. I struggle with the material possessions. I struggle with the world around me. Sometimes I get hopeless. Is our culture going to continue going on this path of anti-godliness? And what can I do to help? Stop it. And the one thing, one thing out of many that you can do is to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with everything about you. Being dedicated to Him and showing up to honor God and worship Him every chance that is available for you. Because there's so many things Satan's going to tell you, come on, you don't need to be there Sunday night. A break. It doesn't matter. Stay home. Turn the TV on. Enjoy yourself. Go visit some family. You don't need to be there. No. Satan will do anything he can to take you away. And the more he succeeds at taking you away, then you start to become part of the other crowd. And that crowd may not be that big. I don't know. I look at Peter who followed Jesus. Remember Peter in the garden saying, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. Sometimes our actions say that exact phrase, I don't know the man. Based on the way we live, the way we think, what we do. What crowd do you belong to? Jesus is telling us that we are his chosen people. That you've been taken out of the darkness. The world is a dark place. He's telling us, do not be conformed to this world. Do not conform. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says prove. You ever say that? Actions speak louder than words. That is your proof that I love the Lord. I have been set aside. I have been chosen for a special purpose. And I want to fulfill that purpose. Or are you kind of walking the fence?
Sometimes your toes are all in, and sometimes your toes are all out. And sometimes you're right in the middle. Where are you at? What group are you a part of? What crowd are you in? I pray you don't get overly wrapped up in this world. Our script reading this morning is 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides, lives, goes on forever. Would you be part of that crowd, of that chosen nation, of that special group? We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you putting your hand to the plow? Are you looking back? Are you looking back at the world around you saying, I don't know, that's some pretty attractive stuff around you. You're one of the people who want to be accepted by the culture. So you won't speak up for Jesus. You won't stand up for Christ. And then you're in verses. Because it's looked down upon. And I have to fear that I won't be accepted when I want to be accepted. Half our lives are lived this way. I want to be accepted by those around me. We don't understand the moment. When we should be thinking, I just want to be accepted by God. I just want to live for Him. Jesus loved me so much, He died for me. Are you going to tell me the world around you would do the same? Maybe someone. Some of the very things that you might not stand up against, I can tell you right now, they'd rather take you out. And I mean take you out as in, I don't want anything part of you because you don't believe what I believe. Whatever that might be. Let me finish with this. Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The big crowd that was saying, crucify him, is on the Broadway. Peter was on the path and he said, I don't know the man. But he repented. Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to be set aside for the purpose of God? And if you've already done so, where are you right now in your, in your walk with God? Or where are you where you should be? Because the crowd could have gotten to you. I need some help because I've fallen into this crowd. And this crowd is taking me away from my first love, which is Jesus. My first love, which is my walk with Christ. My first love. Ladies and gentlemen, it's too easy. It's too easy to get caught up into the crowd. The crowd that says, all you Christians out there, you're fools for even believing there's a God. All you Christians out there are nothing but a bunch of haters. All you Christians out there, get away from this life because it's old, it's ancient nonsense. Will you stand up for God? Will you do what is right? Will you be part of the right crowd? This morning, which crowd are you part of? Which crowd are you participating in? Which crowd do you follow more? I pray that you want to be part of the crowd here, the group here, at this congregation here, and I'm not this congregation here, some other part of the Lord's church. 
and not just 50%, 75%, but 100%. I'm all in, Lord. This morning, if you have not put on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come and confess his name. Repent. Be baptized. Walk a new life. Be a part of this holy nation that's been set aside for him. This morning, if you have not walked the way you should walk, and you think you need some prayers for help, then come forward and let that be known, and let, let us all pray for you. Because the walk sometimes can be difficult. When the crowd around you is screaming, crucify him, crucify him. This morning, if you have any need, please let it be known as we stand and sing.